Hi everyone, Rick Weiss here, Director of Skyline. Welcome to this latest media briefing. I want to take one minute up front just for those of you who may not be familiar with Skyline to know who you are working with here. We are a philanthropically funded, entirely free nonprofit service based at the American Association for the Advancement of Science in Washington, D.C. Uh, with one overarching goal, which is to help get more research-based evidence into your news stories. We know that journalism is changing fast. We know that not everyone who's covering science today has a deep science background or has time to find the science sources that would help you get more evidence into your stories. We offer a variety of free services to help you do that, including our matching service by which you just get in touch with us, tell us what you're working on, and we will help connect you to one or more experts who are not only excellent in their research discipline, but have been vetted for their communication skills as well. We also run all expenses paid boot camps for journalists to get you up to speed on different areas of topics and provide on our website a variety of fact sheets that are designed just for you, hair on fire, on deadline journalists who just wanna get the facts fast. They're produced in house, they're all vetted by outside experts before we post them so you can trust them and use that information in your stories. We also, of course, run these media briefings, um, which we will uh, start in just a moment here. They include typically three experts who will speak briefly because we know that the most important thing you want to do is ask questions. And then we'll open it up for Q&A. As Josh mentioned, you can type in your uh, questions at the end of the briefing, and uh, I will be reading them aloud to our experts. The bios for today's experts are on the Skyline website, so I'm not gonna really spend time to go through, go through them now. I will just mention briefly that the order of events will be that we will hear first from Alice O'Toole, who is a professor in the School of Behavioral and Brain Sciences at the University of Texas at Dallas, who will give us a little bit of an introduction to facial recognition technology and some of the evolution of it and where we're at today, some of the issues uh, arising from that technology. Dr. Patrick Grother, next, is a scientist at NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, uh, division of the U.S. Commerce, Commerce Department that is all about metrics and has, over the last several years, been doing some incredible work to measure the accuracy of facial recognition and will, will help us understand what the word accuracy really means in that case. And we'll talk in particular somewhat about the issue of bias, which uh, is a common sub-theme within stories on this technology. And last, Dr. Nita Farahani, Professor of Law and Philosophy at Duke University School of Law, founding director of Duke Science and Society and chair of Duke's Bioethics and uh, Science Master's Program there, Science Policy Master's Program there, who will talk about some of the social, legal, ethical issues that are being raised um, by this new technology. And with that, let's just turn it over to Dr. O'Toole. Alice, it's all yours. Okay, so I'm sharing my screen now. Let me know when you can see that. Looks good. Okay, so um, I'm going to address a question that uh, we hear asked a lot these days. How accurate is computer-based face recognition? So um, we actually know a lot about this, uh, primarily from tests that have been done at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and Dr. Grother is going to talk about some of that, I'm sure. Um, my perspective is a bit different. My work compares uh, computer-based face recognition to humans, which is a system we all sort of know something about. So what I'm gonna try and do in the short time here is first introduce how we make these comparisons. Then we're gonna go back in time 10 years and talk about how machines were 10 years ago vis-a-vis -vis human metrics. And then fast forward to the present, do an update on that. And then I'll just end with some, just a very quick, um, perspective on how we think about the challenges of recognizing faces of different races by machines and a little bit by humans. Okay, so with that, let's start with the comparisons. So a subject in my lab would be in an experiment like this. They would see pairs of images of this sort. So some of them are pictures of the same people, some are pictures of different people. And they would be required here to give an, an answer as to how sure they are that the person is the same person or different people. And so this would be their rating. So here we see a picture, a pair of pictures of the same person. And so hopefully they would say they're the same. So the machine would take an image 
take the first image, for example, push it through its processing and produce a representation. And then it would take the second image in the pair, push that through and produce a second representation. And suffice to simply measure the similarity of the representations produced by these two, um, uh, by the two images through the machine. Uh, and you have a measure that's really easily comparable to the measure that humans give, okay? And so you would need to set a threshold or a criterion and say anything more than this number we'll call the same person, anything less than this number we'll call different people. Okay, so we've used this technique uh, many, many times in my lab. Let's just focus in on a test we did about 10 years ago on humans and algorithms at the time. So what you're looking at on your screen is six pictures of the same person. And these, uh, NIST uh, was able to divide, National Institute of Standards and Technology was able to divide into pictures that were thought to be very challenging, or not very challenging at all for machines circa 10 years ago. And you can see these are very similar images. More challenging images change the illumination here and the expression, and really very challenging images change lots of things all at the same time. So these are quite challenging to compare. So when we did the human machine comparison 10 years ago, what we found for the good, the pairs of images that were rated to be relatively easy to compare, is that the machine was far better than the humans at these. As the task got a little bit more difficult, uh, the machine was still quite a bit better than humans at this task. And only when we went to these really difficult images was the performance in, of humans and machines about equal. Okay, so let's update that to 2018. And uh, what I'll say uh, before I put up that graph is, first of all, um, over many years of doing these comparisons, we were able to pick out image pairs that are really challenging. Uh, and so we used very challenging image pairs in this comparison we did in 2018. So the other thing I'll say is circa 20, you know, 2012, 2013, 2014, a new algorithm came onto the scene and uh, it has been uh, applied to many tasks in computer vision. And I won't say anything else about the algorithm except to say that um, very quickly performance got quite a bit better than previous generation algorithms. So let me show you the comparison we did recently. Uh, and so to orient you to the graph, random performance is at 0.5, perfect performance is at one. And we tested several groups of human subjects, and I'll talk about those in a second, plus uh, a bunch of algorithms, four algorithms. Okay, so beginning with data on students, so this is our proxy for the, the standard normal person. Uh, what we see in this graph is every black dot is the performance of a single subject in the test. This red dot is the median performance. And so you can see this is in fact a challenging task. Uh, normal people do better than chance, but they're far from perfect. So then we tested a group of uh, specialists, face forensic face recognition uh, examiners. These are people who testify in court. They hail from five continents. And we see that these guys are really very good at this task. The median is way up here. There's lots of people up in this range. And then uh, really the only disturbing thing about these data is that we do have some, some professionals. Okay. Super recognizers, you may have heard of these in recent years. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Alice, your audio is going a little bit bad here. Oh, is that a little better? That's better. Mm -hmm. Close to right. the camera. Okay, so super recognizers are people with no forensic training, but uh, with some talent for face recognition, they actually do very well on this task as well. We also tested a group of fingerprint examiners, and uh, the reason for testing them is they have forensic training, but they don't know anything in particular about faces. And they're certainly better than the students, but not as accurate as the experts on faces. So when we look at the algorithms, beginning with an algorithm in 2015, it performed about at the level of students. An algorithm from 2016 hops up to fingerprint examiners. An algorithm from 2017 is really at the level of super recognizers. And then the latest algorithm we were able to test in this comparison is actually at the level of the best humans. So this was very interesting to us. Um, but honestly, the most interesting result uh, from this 
set of uh, experiments and simulations was what happened when we combined the human and the computer. So if you allowed the judgments of the humans to be combined with the judgments of the best algorithm here, this one, performance there actually gave us a median of very close to perfect. So the combination of the human and the machine working together was better than the best machine alone and any of the best examiners alone. Okay, so um, that's, that's our sort of best performance right now. So the last thing I'll end with um, are some myths on face recognition accuracy across race. And so I don't have long here, so I'm just gonna put these up and I guess we can talk a little bit about them in the questions. Uh, so the first myth is that face identification would be fair if we eliminated the machines. So as a psychologist, and that's, that's actually my training, as a psychologist, I, I can assure you, we know for 50 years that humans doing face recognition are not fair. Uh, it's long been known that people are more accurate on faces of their own race. This has been replicated dozens, if not over 100 times. So getting rid of the machines doesn't solve the bias problem. The second myth is that face recognition systems prior to 2015, which is the new generation of algorithms, were fair. And this I know for sure is not true from um, many, many studies, uh, several of these in my lab, uh, every generation of face recognition algorithm since the first paper we wrote on it in 1991 shows some differential performance as a function of the race of face. The third myth is that race is categorical and we know what those categories are. So in biological terms, certainly race is not categorical. Um, and it is tempting to uh, think of, you know, faces of, you know, ca categories that may or may not be representative of people as a whole. There are many individuals in the world of mixed race uh, descent. And so my concern in, in trying to make categories where categories are very much artificial, uh, if you engineer your systems too much to particular categories, you very much uh, risk um, missing out on uh, or disadvantaging people who are of mi mixed race um, background or people whose category was not selected to be optimized. Um, and the last myth is that uh, one face is as recognizable as any other. And we know as psychologists since the, early, the late 70s here, some faces are simply easier to remember and recognize than others. Think Mick Jagger, think Meryl Streep. They have lots of distinguishing features that make them all more, quote unquote, more unique, more distinctive than other people. And so um, it will never be the case that any face recognition system, be it human or machine, will be equally good at every person's face uh, that we can think about. And then I'd like to uh, put this slide in. There's lots of published work on this. Uh, the ones that, uh, so this uh, summarizes the recent human machine comparisons, and that's a big group of people, including people at NIST, people at Maryland, and people in my group. Um, a recent paper on demographic challenges, and then a lot of these other um, sources for your reference, if they're helpful. So I should stop sharing, correct? Right, right. Thank you, Thank you Alice. Alice. That was great. And I want to remind everyone that all these slides will be available on our website uh, afterwards, so you'll be able to check out those references as, as well. Um, okay, Patrick, you're up. Okay. Uh, let me make this full screen. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, hello, this is, uh, uh, I'll cover some of the same material that Alice just covered, uh, maybe in a slightly different way. Uh, the, key, the first point on this, this slide is that I work for the Department of Commerce uh, in a lab. Uh, we do not do uh, policy and regulation. We do measurement in the context of today's talk. It's about face recognition performance. Um, face recognition algorithms, face recognition systems as they're deployed uh, are tasked with two different things. So this slide is on the first one, which is this idea of one-to-one -one verification. So you get two photographs of me at the top and if a face recognition system doesn't successfully uh, match those together, then you would have a false negative. So the, the system is answering is it the same person or not? And that, 
that decision theory, that decision process occurs in all sorts of domains that we encounter pretty much every day. So a radiologist would look at a, a CT scan and say cancer or not, or uh, appendicitis or not. A soldier might look at some kind of photograph on a battlefield and say, is that a Russian tank or not? Um, pharmaceutical purity might be assessed. Is it a fake drug or not? Biometrics face recognition is saying, is it the same face or not? So the top pair is a, would be a false negative if it, didn't, uh, if it didn't match those two. At the bottom, we've got two different individuals, in this case, sisters. And if, they, if, the, if a system puts those two together and says it is the same person, that's the other kind of mistake, the type, the type one error, which is a false positive. So the key point about this slide is in any kind of decision theory, you end up with false negatives and false positives. Now there are systems fielded like this in border control and in your cell phone perhaps that make these kind of decisions every day using face recognition. Uh, the larger marketplace segment for face recognition is these so-called one-to-many identification systems where in the top row here, a search photograph, in this case me, uh, is searched against a gallery of photographs, which in this case is quite small, but in real world operations extends to the tens or hundreds of millions. And the idea is that you should find me, the needle in the haystack. Uh, if you don't find me, then that would be a false negative. You didn't uh, find something when you should. Uh, the police uh, successfully use such software in the investigation of the Annapolis uh, newspaper office shooting which is, I think, is an ongoing case. And the, the, the suspect didn't carry documents. They searched his face against a Maryland database. And in that case, they got the, the right answer. So it wasn't a false negative. Um, the other kind of error that you can get from one-to-many identification systems is when you search somebody against a database that they're not in. So if you were to search me against, say, the French passport database, uh, I'm not in there. If the system returned anything, that would be a false positive. And that, that is a mistake. Both of these kinds of mistakes occur, false negatives and false positives. Uh, there was a case, I think in 2017, in, oh no, 2011, sorry, in Massachusetts, where now a, a sort of an older system uh, mistakenly matched somebody to uh, a fraud list in, a, in the driving license uh, domain and, uh, and made a false positive. So false positives do occur. When we get to reporting of face recognition, uh, we, the, one, of the, one of the bullets on this slide is talking about uh, to be ensure, ensure that we talk about false positives and false negatives. Before we get to that, uh, we'll sort of back up a little bit and say, if we're talking about face recognition, are we actually talking about recognition or about some other application like classification? If you're trying to guess the age or gender of somebody, that's a classification task, it's not recognition. And there's been some confusion on that in, in the press over the last couple of years. Um, uh, how is face recognition being used? It, sometimes there's confusion. Is it verification, this one-to-one -one task? Is it identification uh, or is it actually something else? Uh, another point that we sometimes see is that blanket statements uh, are usually wrong. So if somebody says face recognition doesn't work or face recognition does work, well, that needs to be qualified by because algorithms uh, vary in their capability. Uh, it's a buyer beware circumstance. These are not commoditized uh, technologies. Uh, accuracy also varies by the kind of images used. If we turn off the lights in a room, quality will degrade, recognition performance will degrade. Accuracy also varies by demographic group, and I'll cover that again in a second. Um, uh, so what we shouldn't do is average across multiple algorithms. Typically systems are fielded with one algorithm on board. So we should talk about that algorithm. Uh, false negatives, false positives. There are other kinds of errors that, uh, that we talk about. Failed detection, failed quality assessment, that's happened in operations. Uh, quoting one number is not usually enough. Uh, way back in 2002, the New York Times covered a report that we'd written and said that accuracy was, was 52%. Because of the trade-off between false positives and false negatives, it's usually not sufficient to talk about uh, one number. 
you have to report two um, and to differentiate between false positives and false negatives. Another key point is talking about the impact of an error. So we can say face recognition say is inaccurate in a certain case, but what are the impacts of that? If we, if we talk about uh, that CAT scan, uh, the, the sort of the medical domain, a false, a false negative on a, on a CT scan might go to uh, somebody's cancer being missed. A false positive would go to uh, some kind of, uh, you know, worry and, and resolution of some, you know, case for the, for the patient. Uh, so the impact is heavily application dependent. That, that applies in biometrics as well as medicine. And false consequences tend to have radically different uh, uh, implications than do false negatives. The last point on this slide is that magnitude matters. Uh, some errors are really quite small. Uh, are they small enough? And that is application dependent. The last slide I've got here is that there's been a massive expansion of the industry. There is a, a vibrant sort of developer community vying for supremacy in this. Uh, Japan, China, US, and Russia are the foremost developers. Um, leading contemporary algorithms are very accurate on high quality images, but you can always degrade images. Uh, the algorithms tolerate poor quality images, but only so far. Some applications uh, are sensitive to false negatives uh, and that quality thing. So quality maintenance becomes important. Uh, many cameras are still being used that don't know what a face is. They're, they're not aware of the signal that they're looking for. And that's unfortunate. Um, in the demographic realm, this is a newsworthy thing. We wrote a report December last year that showed briefly that uh, false positives uh, are much more uh, significant, much larger in magnitude than false negative variations between demographics. So we see higher false positives in women and the old and the young. Uh, we see large variations in false positives by uh, country of origin, which I've used the word race here, but it's by country of origin, where those people were born. Um, uh, and a sort of a forgotten demographic is that uh, twins are not separable by most contemporary algorithms. They cause false positives. So the algorithm matters. Uh, better accuracy overall will give you smaller inequities. Some Chinese algorithms don't exhibit the same uh, bias against Asian faces that Caucasian Western developed algorithms do. Uh, some one to many algorithms, the search algorithms, do mitigate differentials like this. Uh, so the watch, the key sort of takeaway is that any user or prospective user of this should know their algorithm. And with that, I'll stop. Thank you, uh, Patrick. Lots of things we can dig into there in the Q&A, and I'll remind people here that uh, even in advance of the end of this, if you want to start entering any questions, feel free to use the uh, Q&A box at the bottom, I believe at the bottom of your screen, uh, to get those into the queue. And we'll turn it over now to Dr. Nita Farahani. Nita? Yes, hi. Uh, let me just make sure you guys can see. Oops, I want that one. I want the slideshow. All right. Perfect. Is that okay? Great. Um, so just briefly, I'm going to touch on some of the ethical, legal, and social implications of um, facial recognition technology, which obviously has been uh, a big source of conversation in recent days as Clearview technology has uh, become kind of front and center in the news after the New York Times uh, article that uh, was there on it. I'm gonna talk just about three broad categories. One is this idea of policing by consent and why facial recognition technology seems to uh, run at odds with that for people. The unintended consequences of um, facial recognition technology and then uh, to spend a little bit of time on the patchwork of laws and regulations because uh, they're really kind of all over the map, no pun intended, about the way in which people, um, states, cities, police departments, etc., are actually approaching the issues. So to begin with, this concept of policing by consent. So the idea is that the power of the police, at least within this country, in the United States, comes from the people. Constitutionally, um, the people consent to the use of force, the use of surveillance, all in the name of public safety. Um, and so police have to negotiate daily the tightrope between regard for liberty and the use of coercive powers, all while maintaining the trust of the people and public support. 
Um, and as we see areas in which uh, that, um, that, that kind of tightrope that they don't walk well, uh, that's where you see riots and pushback and problems because of concerns about the legitimacy of the police force. Facial recognition technology um, has, uh, for many people, it seems to cross the boundaries of policing by consent. And in particular, um, we expect, uh, for example, that um, any one of us could be um, a suspect uh, if we have committed a crime, or we might end up in a lineup, lineup if we've been convicted of a crime and could be hauled in for that purpose. Um, but you don't expect to be hauled into the police station and to be part of a lineup unless there's some reason to suspect that you've committed a crime. And the idea of being able to search a database in which every single one of us may um, be present uh, instead of uh, having a lineup in which we're brought in based on suspicion makes all of us part of suspicionless searches in a virtual lineup all day long. Um, and there are significant concerns over the deployment of this technology, uh, not just because it brings all of us into these virtual lineups, um, but because of some of the things that my co-panelists are talking about, like algorithmic bias, its accuracy and reliability, especially in matching diverse facial characteristics, um, together with this idea of intruding into the public sphere. Uh, that is, people's private lives suddenly become part of their public uh, sphere, even though they intended only for it to be part of their private lives. Much of this is also happening without transparency. Uh, for example, Maine is one of two states to have specific law, which was inspired by Cold War era secrets, um, that says that officials uh, that, that officials neither have to confirm nor deny the use of digital technologies that may help solve crimes. And so, when there have been questions posed to um, police, Maine State Police, they have responded by saying uh, they refuse to answer and they don't need to confirm nor deny those. That's problematic for this idea of policing by consent. The second is this broad concern about unintended consequences. Um, and here, there are the concerns that it will be used in ways well beyond just finding a high um, a high priority suspect. So for example, chilling effects for people who uh, may be in demonstrations, they're afraid to be in demonstrations for fear of being recognized, for fear of that leading to retaliation simply for exercising their First Amendment rights, or fear of stigmatization. When facial recognition technology is used in public spaces, everywhere that a person goes, such as to visit a mental health professional, to a pharmacy, um, or a clinic uh, are all recorded by facial recognition technology, in addition to recording the people who they associate with, revealing, for example, that a person um, is LGBT, even though they haven't come out formally to anybody because of the association of the people with whom they keep company. The combination of location plus association makes it so troubling for people. So the fact that GPS technology enables uh, the tracking at all times, plus the use of these public cameras, means that you get not just where a person is, but who they're with and what they're doing in those places. It also leads to some interesting consequences like driving the digital world to the physical world. Um, for example, a lot of sex workers have moved their activities online where it's a safer space because it allows um, them to be compensated in ways that uh, exist within a digital medium rather than a physical medium. As facial recognition technology is used for drag nets um, in populations such as that, it's driving them back into the physical world where they're less safe. So it can have unintended safety consequences for individuals, including for immigrant populations who are afraid that, um, for example, uh, databases of IDs are being used to scan for and identify people who are illegally within the country, using it for much broader purposes, for dragnet purposes, for um, identifying those individuals. It may be used in settings such as education and employment, leading to persecution of individuals. It's already deployed in a number of educational settings to try to identify people who shouldn't be there. Uh, but the worry is that that creates an even greater chilling effect of association um, and other types of things in those settings. So the last area I want to talk on briefly um, is to talk about the patchwork of laws and regulations, which each of these photographs representing a different way in which this is being regulated. So for states, there are 21 states and DC which allow federal investigators to, to, to scan driver license, license photos. The FBI has access to more than 641 million faces across local, state, and federal databases. Um, and while uh, many states are enabling this, three states have gone forward to ban facial recognition test technology used in police body cameras like Oregon, New Hampshire, and most recently California. Cities 
uh, and city level restrictions may exist. So San Francisco and Oakland, California, Brookline, Cambridge, Northampton, and Somerville, Massachusetts have all banned the use of rec facial recognition technology by city agencies. The city council in Portland, Oregon has proposed going a step further, banning the technology in both public and private sectors. Um, consent uh, may play a part in a number of these different states. So Texas law, like Illinois, requires individuals or companies who collect biometric data to inform individuals before capturing the biometric identifier for them. And some states are capturing facial recognition technology under their privacy laws or their data protection laws, um, like GDPR, for example, in Europe would apply to it, uh, but also the more recent California privacy law um, includes biometric information and limitations on its collection. Some states have just biometric based laws um, where they specifically call out um, Biometric Information Privacy Act, for example, or other types of biometric limitations, uh, which say specific, um, create specific rules about how they can be used. Law enforcement agencies in many other cities have also taken a stance on technology. Some, like the Seattle Police Department, have stopped using facial recognition technology. Locally, where I am, just a few days ago, Raleigh decided to discontinue its relationship with Clearview after the uh, public outcry of, of it. Also, a number of companies are issuing terms of service violations, um, claiming things like cease and desist. Uh, rules apply for breach of contract. The final thing I want to touch on just briefly um, to introduce it so that we can talk about it more in Q&A is the role that the Fourth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution plays um, in regulating this. Traditionally, the Fourth Amendment has said that things that are identifying features of an individual that they voluntarily expose to the public, like their face, are not things that are subject to search. That means that the police don't have to have a warrant to search your face because you voluntarily expose it to the public all day long, so you don't have a privacy interest in your face. Um, that is uh, the existing law, which means that searching things like a facial recognition database may not be considered a search for Fourth Amendment purposes um, and therefore not violating a person's Fourth Amendment rights. But that'll be an interesting area to kind of follow and watch because um, that was true about our location as well, where it used to be the case that what, tracking your location or following you because you voluntarily go from place to place isn't something subject to Fourth Amendment protections until GPS technology enabled attaching a small device to a vehicle, following a person 24 hours a day, seven days a week, such that the US Supreme Court said this difference of decree this ubiquitousness of the ability to follow a person changes the Fourth Amendment analysis such that now GPS technology, when done 24 hours a day, seven days a week, following you from public to private places is now a Fourth Amendment privacy interest and does require the police to actually get a warrant before attaching a GPS device to your car. That may be what we see happens with uh, the broadening scope of uh, facial recognition technology, but we're not there yet. So as of today, there's a big question mark about how the US Supreme Court and how other courts would address the question of the applicability of the Fourth Amendment to facial recognition scans. I mean, look forward to your questions. Thanks. Thank you, Nita. Really interesting. Another issue the founding fathers could never have imagined, and we'll see how the courts decide to uh, pull that together in the years ahead. It's years ahead. Okay, we're going to go to uh, Q&A here. Again, if you have questions, please type them into your Q&A box, and um, we will start reading those to the group here. I have one right off the bat from Jill Draper, a freelancer who asks that uh, various media sources have encountered government officials being secretive and sometimes lying about their use of facial recognition. The ACLU is suing federal agencies over this. Are there any ways to determine where or when facial recognition is being used in one's community? Yeah, so I mean, the problem is, the answer is yes, but the difficulty is the timeline of your story and getting the answers. <laughs> mm. So for longer uh, investigative journalism pieces, it's possible to submit FOIA requests. Um, and uh, and, and I'll, I'll include an example that Rick can share with you guys. There was a, an interesting um, exchange with the Durham Police Department here in North Carolina where somebody submitted, a, a, a journalist submitted a FOIA request. Um, the request was not worded carefully enough 
And so the police were able to respond and say, we have nothing responsive to your request. When the language of the request was changed slightly, uh, such that it would encompass any kind of contract, uh, negotiated, pending, um, or uh, being contemplated uh, and discussed, it captured uh, a broader set of communications that were then released to the journalist. Um, so really, I think the best check and the only check is all of you uh, being willing to place media pressure on federal agencies, on states, um, on public uh, entities that are subject to disclosure laws and requesting that they disclose them. As I mentioned, Maine um, is one of two states that has these non-disclosure laws, but every other state uh, is subject to disclosure of the use of this technology by police forces, including the federal government. Thank you. Um, question here directed to Chris, to, uh, sorry, uh, to Dr. Grother. Christopher Damien from the Desert Sun says, I had a municipal police department point me at NIST's 2015 publication, data format for the interchange of fingerprint, facial, and other biometric information, when I asked how he advises businesses on which security cameras to install. Is that the intended purpose of this NIST publication? If not, what is it intended to be used for? Does this reference mean that the police department is using security camera footage with any particular type of biometric analysis technology? That standard is uh, something that we developed uh, in consultation with industry and other government uh, agencies uh, over many years, uh, going back to the mid 1980s. And it really is a biometric data interchange format, originally for fingerprints, and it was extended later to for have faces and tattoos and uh, uh, latent fingerprints and some other things, uh, DNA, uh, that standard doesn't, as far as I know, regulate anything to do with video surveillance. There's no format within that standard for video cameras uh, or video interchange formats. Uh, so it's, it's mostly to do with bread and butter, routine uh, fingerprinting and mugshot capture. Uh, yeah. And maybe I'll just add to that question because you made a reference earlier to the fact that some police departments or other institutions are using cameras that still cannot recognize faces. Uh, is that a built-in software feature in some cameras and not others that, uh, that they have the potential to do a better job with face recognition than others? So you're familiar with, you know, most contemporary cell phones and point and shoot cameras uh, are aware of what they're looking at and they're trying to take a nice photograph for social media or for whatever. They're not really uh, trying to take a photograph for biometrics. So uh, contemporary face recognition algorithms are using low resolution and they want frontal sort of passport style photos, but quite low resolution. And there is a potential benefits for doing a better job with uh, uh, cameras that are able to uh, collect at higher resolution and potentially to distinguish between twins, which contemporary algorithms and systems don't do. Question here for Dr. O'Toole. What do scientists know about the ability of other species to recognize human faces? We, we heard about humans and machines. Uh, they know that in a lot of cases, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's always a question of degree. So um, face recognition has been shown in other species, and certainly there's a fair bit of data on macaques and so on about their ability to distinguish faces by identity, both uh, faces of other animals of their species and human faces. Um, but it's always a question of degree. I mean, human recognition ability is uh, remarkable in the sense that I can show a picture of someone you know from the front, uh, from a side view, uh, laughing, smiling, 10 years ago, uh, and we are able to do a great deal more generalization. It is possible other species are able to do this, but those tests have not really been done. Question here from the New York Times. The Supreme Court cited one of my stories in the G GPS case uh, that Nita mentioned as per the expectation of privacy. Is there any analogous expectation of privacy when walking down a street? Um, meaning, do you have an expectation of privacy similar to the Carpenter case? I'm, that's how I'll interpret that. 
Um, and in general, the answer is no, right? So, so what was what was unique and interesting about the Carpenter case, and what was unique and interesting about the decision by the court to, try to say that the Fourth Amendment applies, is to say that a difference in degree can change what has been the traditional standard. The traditional standard is anything you do in public, um, in plain view, is not subject to the protections of the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Um, and it's in, in this kind of strange legalistic way, which is it's not a search if it's something that you can see in plain view. So it's um, it's a very, of course, it's a search in common parlance, but it's not a search according to the Supreme Court. And uh, the Carpenter case said, no, no, it is a search if it happens all the time. If you're just walking down the street and a picture is captured of you in a single instance, um, and not everywhere you go, and it's not complete surveillance 24 seven, it may not arise to the level of difference in degree that the court said made GPS tracking a search for Fourth Amendment purposes. Um, I think the more widespread the technology becomes, mm -hmm. the more likely it will violate an expectation of privacy, which is a little counterintuitive because um, the, the, the more common something that becomes, the less we expect it to be private. Uh, but in this instance, if everywhere you go at all times is being tracked and everyone you associate with is at all times being photographed, um, I think the average person would feel like that's quite intrusive. That's how it rises to the level of a Fourth Amendment challenge. And I think even this court, the conservative court, would be likely to say that under the Carpenter precedence that that's a Fourth Amendment violation. But it remains to be seen. Is there any sense from the uh, litigation so far what it would take to hit a threshold like that? Would you have to be, you know, some camera on you at least 10 hours of every waking day to hit that line of, yeah, you are just always being tracked? I suspect it's it's not so much time as it was with GPS. I think um, the 24 seven, part of it was time, but part of it is that people were being followed into private places when they were home or when they weren't, which is traditionally part of your private domain. It's the most sensitive place is the home traditionally. And so when the police come into your home through GPS tracking, it violates this public private divide. Um, and I think when uh, facial recognition technology goes from street corners to more private locations, you know, every time you walk into a mental health clinic, every time you go into uh, a place that you traditionally thought you had a more private right of access. I think it's it, when that transition occurs is when I think we're more likely to see um, courts saying this really does violate the Fourth Amendment. Thank you. Uh, a question here from Tasha Williams, a freelance writer. What is being done to acknowledge and address algorithm biases related to gender and race? How does the status quo impact already marginalized communities? I think maybe Alice and Patrick, but maybe you might each want to address that. I can just say it's a very active area of research to um, be able to address these issues in the algorithms, for sure. Um, that said, I, from what I know of it, maybe Patrick will agree with me, I don't think an easy solution is around the corner. When the models were really simple, people thought it was just a question of training the, the networks with the right proportion of category A and category B and category C, and then you'd get equal performance. I think most people now think that these more complicated algorithms, that's going to be maybe part of it, but it is not going to be the entire story. So the newer algorithms require quite a bit of training with very, very large numbers of identities and pictures of identities. And um, sometimes it has been difficult to get those kinds of data sets to do the training in equal measure. Um, but there's also a sense probably that there, there, we may have to do other things to, to address the problem. Um, I agree with what uh, Patrick said at the end of his talk. I mean, right now, I think the biggest stress has to be on being sure you're testing the algorithms for performance uh, that is appropriate for the, the venues you intend to use them. So uh, I'll let Patrick talk as well. Yeah, I'll agree with that. The, 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 it's a research issue. The report that we wrote sort of put some sunlight on, on the various performance variations that the developer 
community wouldn't have been aware of or were not certainly not uniformly aware of uh, and a number of them have, have, have sort of started to work on this to try and mitigate differentials by race by by uh, by age and by sex um, it, it's 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 a tough problem though the, the the, the one thing that our report did show is that the Chinese developers, uh, one of them disclosed that they'd used uh, up to 500 million images from a Chinese dating website in their development. Uh, the, their algorithms don't show these higher false positive rates in a Chinese population, which is what many Western developed algorithms do. Um, so that is some kind of existence proof that um, training can matter and can help. Uh, but uh, right now, it's, it's, there's a problem and it needs to be addressed. And if I can just add one more thing uh, along the lines of the myths I was talking about is that, um, for example, if you were able to make your algorithm equal on males and females, um, what does that mean for transgender individuals or for people in transition? You have no assurance that people who do not typically fit exactly the stereotypical ca characteristics of male, female, or um, you know, Vietnamese or Japanese or Chinese or uh, Ethiopian, you know, the middle ground uh, is is what I'm very concerned that we will over engineer to the center of a category and disadvantage uh, people who don't fit that category very well. And and Patrick, just to add, even if training size training set size can help, my understanding is that some of the biggest players have not actually submitted their materials to NIST for assessment, right? Some of the Googles or others in the world? That's correct. Uh, for various reasons, uh, you know, participation in the evaluations that we do is entirely voluntary. It's open worldwide and we do this for free, uh, but uh, each uh, developer has got their own reasons to participate or not to participate. Uh, you mentioned Google. I'm sure they're capable of doing their own tests. Internally, they're not really trying to sell biometrics. Uh, in the commercial marketplace. But uh, again, that would be a question for them. That said, you should probably uh, say that the NIST, that your report, I believe, if I have it right, tested some 188 algorithms. Do I have that number right? Maybe it's 100. It goes up every day. It goes up every day. So a lot of people, a lot, a lot of companies and academicians voluntarily participate to know how well they do. I mean, those are really the gold standard tests. So they want to know where they are. Nobody measures like NIST, so that's a wonderful <laughs> service. A uh, question from Marie Tem sorry, Maria Temming from Science News. I'm concerned about facial recognition technology invading my privacy. Are there any steps that I personally can take besides pushing for legal restrictions to protect myself? For example, are there any studies that show whether making a strategic alteration to my appearance can confuse algorithms? Likewise, have researchers developed any adversarial algorithms that can scramble facial recognition systems if they're being used in an unauthorized way? Patrick, that's by you. Yeah, there's, uh, you, you can casually degrade your, your sort of facial presentation to a camera, then that will be effective. But it's something that's difficult to do 24 seven. And so uh, if, if if a persistent surveillance gets a good photo of you, then the face recognition is very likely to succeed. Um, the, the better approach to doing this is uh, a set of technologies for, uh, that would require some regulation on their use, but uh, it, would, um, it would use cameras, say, in a department store, but it would replace people's faces with fake faces. Um, and the purpose in doing that is that, yes, you could, uh, uh, you could follow people, you could count people, but you wouldn't actually identify people. Uh, you, you wouldn't uh, expose the real face of an individual to, um, to a government or to uh, somebody. So these de-identification technologies that do subtle damage to a face so that you can't be identified later, uh, they are worthy of evaluation, and there there is a commercial marketplace for that. I bet. Nita or Alice, anything to add there? 
Yeah, I, I, um, which is, so the one thing I would just encourage you to, to think about as you, um, as you all write about the privacy concerns of individuals is to help people articulate what the fears are. Um, because I think people in general are afraid of surveillance technologies. And I, I laid out some of them, right? Some of the unintended consequences, which are the potential for misuse in certain settings, like employment settings, um, to hire, fire, uh, make decisions like that, or in, in societies in which um, there is less freedom of expression, and freedom of association, and the likelihood of persecution by being identified. And so the chilling effects that it could have both uh, in those societies and also in our society, if uh, you have fear of association um, and implications for that. But uh, that's where ideally we can start to encourage people to articulate what are the fears we have? Is it really the virtual searches um, that are being uh, that are occurring by the police department, which may not harm an individual, right? So to be hauled into a police station is a very different experience than virtually being searched and never being aware that you are part of a search set. Um, is it uh, the discrimination and misuse, in which case we should be advocating for people uh, and for legislators and for states to come up with policies that um, safeguard against those misuses. Um, is it the lack of transparency, uh, then we should be encouraging transparency of the types of uses to which it's being put. I think there can be legitimate uses of this technology and narrowly used and clearly identified and, and made transparent um, it may not be as concerning for people. And that's where I think your role of helping people understand like, what is it that they're afraid of? And what is it that people should be advocating for uh, states and um, police departments and cities and uh, other governments to be doing uh, can really help. That's very helpful. Trying to mute my With the police in the sorry. background. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're after me now. Yes. Uh, great. I want to have maybe time for one last question here, and this is one uh, referencing Dr. O'Toole's statement earlier that some people, I think, will never forget this part of your presentation that Mick Jagger and Meryl Streep seem so easy. So uh, the question is, you know, is it the same for machines? Do machines find those same faces that we find easy to recognize? to be easy to recognize or is it something else altogether? So that's a really good question. Uh, these are tests that we did on algorithms years ago. And yes, the, definitely they're, the, the ones that were tested years ago do find certain faces more recognizable than other faces. And you can see that by you know, the similarity scores the machine produce. Either they're totally certain it's the same person because there's a match there that is very, very informative diagnostic of the identity. Uh, so think the really, you know, the thick lips of Mick Jagger or whatever. Um, the newer algorithms, I think, uh, uh, are still not well understood. They're very large computational engines that do sometimes hundreds of millions of nonlinear local computations and produce a result that is very accurate or supports very accurate face recognition, but we're not quite sure about what the representation is. And that's also a very active area of research. Those machines are designed to kind of mimic the human visual system, which does in fact compute with hundreds of millions of neurons that go between the retina and higher levels of cortex where face recognition seems to be done. Um, and we don't really understand the nature of the code we use. And I think we're now at a level where these machines are complicated enough that it will take some study to figure exactly uh, what it is about faces, the machines are remembering, and whether it's the same types of things we as humans hold on to in distinctive faces. Patrick, anything to add there? Uh, no, uh, it is a research issue to try and understand how current face recognition algorithms work. Um, it's worth noting that algorithms vary in their capability, but they also vary in their sensitivity to demographics. We talked about that, but also in their sensitivity to other things. Like if you're not looking at the camera, do you get more false positives? If you've got a very low resolution image, do you get more false positives? And these kind of sensitivities, it's incumbent on sort of end users to understand those as best they can. Wonderful. One last question, New York Times, uh, again, uh, John Quinn. Are there any laws in the United States to prevent the use of this technology in school admissions, employment, loan applications, et cetera? 
Peter? Um, yes and no. So, uh, so the states that have um, placed bans on facial recognition technologies, those can apply to those settings as well. Um, the states that have biometric laws and that have um, general privacy laws like California uh, specifically um, call out biometrics and the use of biometrics and the limitations of biometrics. But, you know, as for really specific legislation that says it would be misused in the following settings, um, you know, educational settings, employment settings for um, use, discrimination, et cetera, uh, there is no state that calls it out specifically right now. It's just if it falls within the general categories of these other uh, sets of privacy legislation. It's likely that if federal legislation does develop, and there's been some proposals, uh, both specific to facial recognition technology, as well as the general privacy conversation that's happening at the federal level, it's likely that there would be um, specific mention of biometrics and what different institutions can do with biometrics. Um, and presumably some of those institutions would be covered by those types of legislation. But as of today, the answer is, um, unless it's within those general privacy laws, no. This has been so interesting and we're just about out of time. I want to just give each speaker, you know, half a minute to make a final point, reiterate a take home point. You know, if there's one or two things you want our reporter class to walk away with today, um, what would you like to leave them thinking about? I'll start with you, Dr. O'Toole. So I guess I would say um, it, from, from my perspective, it's been very interesting to see how much more accurate algorithms have gotten over the last number of years um, to the point where I definitely, in the tests that we've done, there are a number of cases, if I could look at the two images and say, you know, I would trust the machine over the human in that case, if the quality of the image is excellent and the quality of the training data and so on. So they have gotten very good. Um, uh, that said, uh, there's still a lot of questions about how these machines operate and understanding, you know, none of them is perfect, so they still make mistakes and understanding these mistakes are super important. Um, I think we should also um, uh, remember that um, humans make mistakes as well, and humans make mistakes of all different kinds and, um, you know, the best of the best of face recognition accuracy would be to combine the good things that humans can do that the machines don't do well and vice versa. And so think of it more as a tool uh, than as something, especially in law enforcement, than as something anybody wants operating alone, either the human or the machine. So. I would second that. Um, yeah, I would second that. Uh, the, the errors coming out of face recognition systems invariably end up in the lap of a human. And so the uh, ability of humans to adjudicate pairs of images is uh, an important topic um, and subject to some of the same kind of reporting of metrics that, uh, that the automated algorithms are. So to my takeaway point is uh, that coverage of face recognition accuracy uh, can be improved by talking about false positives and false negatives, about if one-to-one -one systems, uh, one-to-many systems, uh, and to talk about the sort of the domain of use. How are systems being used? Is it for access control? Is it for video surveillance? Is it for recording your immigration status when you get on a plane? Uh, some specificity into the various different applications uh, and, and how they're used and the impact of errors is, is important. Great, great take home that accuracy really, uh, relevance of it has everything to do with how it's being used. Um, Nita, to wrap up. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that's a great point to build off of, which is um, even assuming a world in which you have perfectly accurate technology, which we're far from, it can, in certain settings, be perfectly wrong to use it. Uh, and it's trying to figure out what are the appropriate uses and what do we as a society consider to be misuses of technology. Um, so facial recognition technology for many people has raised significant concerns. For many um, of the average public, hearing that Clearview is scraping um, images that they have online uh, and that they have um, used for very different purposes than uh, the one that it's now being applied to uh, is really concerning. I hope that as you all write stories about this, that 
Um, you help people both to understand the limitations of the technologies that exist today, but also in a world in which those limitations um, become fewer and fewer and the accuracy improves, that there will still be significant um, ethical, legal, and social implications to this technology, which we need to evaluate to decide what are the uses to which we as a society will be comfortable uh, for it being applied. Fantastic. I want to thank our three panelists today for wonderful presentations and answers to questions. I want to remind everyone, uh, all the reporters, before you log off, when you log off, you will get a prompt for a very short 30-second, three-question survey. It's so helpful to us um, to hear your quick responses to those three questions. I hope you'll take a moment to do that for us and help us um, keep these briefings as beneficial and useful to you as possible. Please follow Sideline at, at Real Sideline on Twitter and uh, go to our website, sideline.org, and see what else we can do to help you in your jobs as reporters to put as much scientific evidence into your stories as possible. And with that, we'll end this briefing, and thank you very much for attending.